Uh, verse number 12. So John chapter number 14, verse number 12. Um, in the previous two messages, here in chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, uh, we found out that Jesus is going away. Jesus is preparing, and mansions are awaiting our arrival in glory land. Amen. In verses 4 through 11, we found out Jesus is the only way to the Father's house. He said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man come to the Father but by me. And then the night's message is Jesus saying to the disciples, remember he's in the upper room. He is preparing them for his death, departure, his ascension back to heaven. He's not going to be there with them personally. But Jesus is saying to them in these verses, Jesus is going to be there in heaven, but he's going to be here also in the person of the Holy Spirit. So the message is very, very important truth, not only to the disciples, but for us tonight, for God's people in this day and age, it is important. I think it is probably a neglected truth, a misunderstood truth, and even maybe a forgotten truth. And there is just one really thing I want to key in on tonight, and we're going to cover all the verses, but there's one important passage verses that I want to look at. Let's begin in verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall in a few days be in you. Verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. And he that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. He that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judah saith to him, not Iscariot, you remember that Judas Iscariot has already left uh, the, uh, the upper room dinner. And he said that, uh, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. There are several things, and some, you know, really great messages that Jesus is giving, great truths, great principles that the Lord is giving in this passage. And you could really preach a message on each of these great truths. Uh, in verse 12, we see, first of all, the miracle of greater works. He said, uh, verily, 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 and that is about the 22nd time Jesus used that phrase, verily, verily. That means truthfully, truthfully. I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now that is the result of the um, omnipresence of the Holy Spirit compared to the physical presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. If the Lord were still here today, he would only be in one place at one time. For once he took upon the body, and that body came out of the grave. He is no longer just spirit. He is spirit and body. And he was as they was at that time. He is, he is limited to being at one place at one time. So he's, he's indicating that the presence of the Holy Ghost is going to be able to be everywhere with every person 
Uh, he is here tonight. The Bible says we're two or three gathered in his name. He'd be in the midst. He's with Brother Johnny Jones over in Oceana, West Virginia. He was in Brian Treadway over in Abington, Virginia. He's with that's my brother uh, Massingill over in McQuady, Kentucky. He is with uh, Brother Jones down in South Carolina. He is with Gene Rao down in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, he is with all these men of God. He's over in, in uh, Scotland with Brother Hotnet in the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, when it says greater works than be shall he do, that can be a confusing thing. And uh, first of all, there's going to be greater in number. Jesus was limited on one place at one time. He was also limited to three and a half years of ministry. Once John the Baptist baptized him and he began his ministry, then the miracles began to follow. And so there's going to be greater works in the number of things that's going to take place. For example, uh, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were saved. That's more than Jesus had saved in three and a half years. And that happened on one day. And so he's going to be greater in number, equal in power, but because there's going to be 12 of them going out, or 11 of those, plus the other apostles, plus Barnabas and Silas and other men of God through the book of Acts going out all the way to bring in the gospel to America, to your house, to your home, to your heart. Uh, there's going to be a greater outreach. There's going to be a greater thing. For example, you know, um, people came to hear Peter preach. The Bible says they, they just uh, sat down and hoped the shadow of of Peter would fall across them and they would be healed. Jesus never did that. The Bible talks about those who would bring handkerchiefs and won't, won't Paul to bless them and that they would be healed because of those handkerchiefs. That never happened in Jesus' day. A greater inner out, outreach because here is Judea. I mean, we, we read this morning, or quoted this morning, Acts 1 8, but well, you shall see power that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, and uh, he said, in Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. So there's going to be a greater outreach. Not only is Jesus limited to the miracles that he did from Nazareth to Jerusalem in the land of Israel, but these things are going to be multiplied over and over again throughout the whole world. Matter of fact, there's not only going to be Jews, but Gentiles saved. Listen to what Jesus told the disciples in Mark chapter, um, Matthew chapter 10 verse 5. Then the twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them saying, Go not, listen, go not into the way of the Gentiles uh, and into any of the city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost house of the house of Israel. So he said, while he was there, seeing the disciples out, he said, it's not time for the Gentiles. There were Gentiles saved, but he said, that's not the emphasis right now. It's the Jews. It is the kingdom of God. And so we find that here Jesus said, once that takes place, uh, and it's over in the book of Acts, he said, go into you know, all the world and preach the gospel to every creature now. You can go to the Jews. You can go to the Gentiles. You can go to Africa. Uh, Thomas went to India. Others went over into Spain, and from Spain into to, uh, Europe, from Europe into uh, let's say the, the countries of Wales and England where our pilgrim forefathers came from, brought the gospel to America, brought the gospel to here and we're here tonight and we're saved because the Holy Ghost of God came and because he uh, was able to embrace and empower every man of God, every preacher every teacher that went forth under his power. Now he gives the reason stated, he says because I go unto my Father. He said, so the only way the Holy Ghost can come is if I go unto my Father. Now, I don't understand all that, but it seems as if, um, and I probably said this before, it seems as though they, the Father never wants to be alone. Either the Spirit's there or the Son's there. The Spirit couldn't leave until the Son showed up. When the Son showed up, the Spirit came. And so we find that this is... Uh, 
the Holy Ghost coming. He's, he's telling them about the ministry of the Holy Spirit to them, not just to the world. In chapter 16, he said the Spirit of God is going to come, the comfort is going to come, he's going to convict the world of the sin of righteousness and judgment. But here's what he's going to do for you. Now, first of all, that is a great encouragement to the disciples. Because Jesus is telling them that his work, his miracles are not going to cease and that the works would now be done by the disciples themselves in greater number, in a greater area, going all around the world to every people, everywhere. This is greater works than I did, you're going to do. So what seemed like a tragedy in the fact that Christ is going to be departing and was a became a really became a blessing to the whole world we are blessed tonight because jesus left the disciples and went back to heaven he died for the world then he sent disciples he sent pastors evangelists missionaries to preach the gospel to the entire world every nation every creature every tongue every tribe even in tribulation period the bible says people of every nation tongue and tribe are going to be saved and born again i'm here tonight and i'm saved because jesus ascended and sent the holy ghost to convict sinners that they might be saved hallelujah jesus always knows what he's doing and always going to work out for the best but there is a condition notice in verse 12 brother brother I say unto you he that believeth on me you want to do greater more works greater miracles greater, greater works than Jesus did you're going to have to have faith he said to the disciples you're going to have to have faith I mean they're looking at themselves and they've never done much the Bible says they went out two by two preached the gospel and he said they cast out some demons and they came back bragging about it and said, Oh, Lord, the, the, the demons are subject to us. He said, Don't rejoice in that. Just rejoice that your name's written in the book of life. Don't get too proud and cocky about that. That can leave, but your eternal life will never leave. And so it is a encouragement. There's a condition. Faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Whatsoever not of faith is sin. And so God always requires faith. A lot of people don't serve God because of weakness of faith. There's a lot of men being called the mission field who wouldn't go because of a weakness of faith. Uh, there's a lot of parents who discourage their children from serving God or especially going to the mission field. Well, you know how dangerous it is over there, you know, uh, you know and, and they just discourage them. Why? Because they had no faith. I mean, if, I, if one of my boys got called the mission field, I'd say, son, the only place you can go is the mission field. And if God called you, he'll take care of you and he'll watch over you more than I can if you were right here with me. I can't do anything for you. God can do everything for you. be hard to send them away. be hard because we wouldn't get to see each other uh, except maybe phone, video, and, and uh, Facebook and all that. But faith is required. And that's what Jesus said to these twelve. Now he's saying to people who are saved. He's saying to the eleven who are saved. Called of God. Called unto himself. He's talking to the church in a sense that we talked about this morning. And he said, you who are saved have to believe on me. <clears throat> Trust me. And we'll get the job done. So there's the miracle of greater works. And then secondly... We see the ministry of prayer, verse 13 and 14. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. And Jesus was always wanting to glorify the Father. In verse 14, if you ask anything, shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. He said that twice. You shall ask, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. And if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. So here is another great encouragement to the disciples. You, you really, to get the meat of the message, you've got to put yourself in the place of these men who have been with Jesus for three and a half years. Next day, he's going to be taken, uh, and then he's going to be crucified He's going to be in the grave three days. He's going to send back to heaven. Then he's going to come back. And he's going to be on the earth for 40 days. 
And the Bible says on the day of Pentecost, of course, he's going to come and, and the Holy Ghost is going to come. He's going to send back to heaven for good at that time. And so we understand that he's talking here about the fact that he's going away, but he is saying, don't, don't worry about that. I'm going away, but I'm not going to be here in person to listen to your requests, to hear your prayers, to answer your prayers, to hear what you need. I, I will be here, but in a person of the Holy Spirit, and I will meet your needs, and you can answer questions, answer your questions. He is saying, whatsoever you ask in my name, I will do it. I'm going away, but the Holy Ghost is going to come. And Romans chapter 8 said, the Spirit of God uh, takes our infirmities to the heaven, and God helps us as we pray. And when we pray, we can be assured that he hears us. They could not ask him directly or personally as they had been used to. So Jesus is saying, now there's a new avenue of prayer. You don't come to me, but you come in my name. If you'll come in my name, it's going to have the same effect as if you were talking to me directly. You come in my name, get on your knees. Listen, they're going to go out of the garden, out of the upper room. Jesus is going to go in the garden and pray. The Bible says that's when he prayed uh, the uh, prayer where he said, Lord, if, if it's thy will, thy will be done. If it's not thy will, you know, let this cup pass from me. And that's when he prayed. The Bible says, Hebrew says this, he prayed with strong crying and tears there in the garden as he's facing crucifixion. And so he's saying, I'm still going to be around in the Holy Spirit. We are absolutely dependent upon the Holy Spirit today. Jesus is not here, but he did send the Holy Spirit. And we're to pray in the Spirit. We're to witness in the Spirit. We understand the Scriptures in the Spirit. We pray. We do everything that we're supposed to do. We have to do in the power and directed toward the Spirit of God with Him in mind. Now notice there is a personal relationship in coming to the Father in His name. Now, my father's uh, gone. He died in about 2012. And uh, so he's been gone about eight years. Next month in September, he'll be dead 12 years. But if my father were alive, and I would say, Barry, if you go to my father, you need $100,000, you tell him I sent you, and he will give it to you. He's going to not give it to Barry because he don't know Barry. But when you say, Doug Seahorn, Jr., told me to come to you and you'd give me $100,000, if he had it, he would reach back and he'd give it to him in my name. So I don't come in my name. I don't come in the name of the church. I don't come in anybody else's name. When I come to him, I come in the name of Jesus. I come in the name of his son. There was a man who was a very rich man and he had a really a, a, a mansion kind of a place that he lived in and he had all kinds of artwork just really expensive you know really artwork worth hundreds of thousands of dollars and so the man the gardener his son had died he had a son one son who died and so the butler, the gardener, somebody was left in charge of the wheel and he held a, a sale. He was going to auction off all the, the, um, all the paintings, all the great artwork in this, in this mansion. And so everybody gathered that day uh, and they began, uh, uh, you know, he got up and, okay, the auction is going to start and the first article that we're going the first item that we're going to auction off is this portrait of the man's son and nobody you know it wasn't a good portrait and they didn't know him and it probably wasn't worth very much money and he said do I have any bids and it was quiet nobody bid uh, this has to be the first one to go anybody want to buy this this anybody want to buy this this portrait of you know, Mr. Jones's son. Anybody want to? <laughs> Finally, a man raised his head and said, I'll buy it. And he mentioned the price. I mean, just, you know, piddly money. $50, $100. Uh, 
and he said, sir, come get the portrait. He got the portrait, gave his money. And he said, the auction is over. He said, the auction is over. They said, what? What? We come all this way. The auction is over. He said, yeah, because the will stipulates that whoever gets the son gets it all. I'm glad I found it all in Jesus. When I come to God in Jesus' name, I can get it all in His name. The personal relationship between God and the Son. At His baptism, the Father spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus so pleased the Father that whoever comes in His name will have an answer to prayer. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's a personal relationship. And in this passage here, Jesus is going to encourage them to get in on this very personal relationship with the Father. He is saying, claim the promise. Look at verse 14 again. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. This is the most unbelieved truth in the Bible. People don't believe that. People won't, don't pray. The reason we do not pray is because we do not believe. Jesus, or James wrote and said, <coughs> you have not. <clears throat> One simple reason, you ask not. And you don't ask because you don't believe. If you really believed, if you really trusted that Jesus said, I will do it. Whatever, anything you do in my name, I will do it. If we believe that, we get more answers to prayer. But the reason we do not pray is we just don't have that kind of faith in the Bible, in God, in Jesus, in His Word. The reason we do not see these greater miracles, these greater works, is because we do not pray. The reason we do not have needs met sometimes is because we didn't ask. You have not because you ask not. Prayer is a neglected truth. Prayer is a neglected practice. And it's the most unbelieved truth probably in all the Bible. Even folks who believe that Jesus died, buried, and rose again, those who have repented, those who have been saved, have a hard time believing that if they ask in Jesus' name and for God's glory, that God will do it for them because they came. we come in Jesus' name. Notice in verse 16, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And I'll not deal long here. John 14, 16, all of this chapter from at least here onward is about the, the Holy Spirit. But beginning in verse 16, he said, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Another comforter. Another one just like me. Jesus comforted the disciples. He encouraged the disciples. That's what he's doing right now. He is encouraging the disciples. He is comforting them because he knows that when he dies and they see the horrible agony of Calvary and their, their hearts are going to drop out the bottom, they're going to be so down and discouraged, but he's going to encourage them and prepare them for that hour so that they will go on and do the will of God and preach the gospel to the whole world. He's now pray the Father, he'll, he'll give you another, another, not the first comfort, another comfort. That word another means one of the same exact kind that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because they see him not, neither know him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you. Now, Jesus can say this, he is with you right now. But in John chapter 20, after the resurrection, remember Jesus comes back into that same upper room where the disciples, the Bible says, are hiding for fear. And he just appears in the room. And he said, the Bible says in John 20 and verse number 22, and he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So he said... The Holy Spirit is with you, but He shall be in you. I've never been in you. I've been with you for three and a half years, but I'm leaving. But the Holy Spirit's not only going to be with you, and He's going to be another comforter just like me. He's going to be an encourager just like me, but He's going to be in you. 
so that no matter where you go, you can't leave him behind. You can't walk off without him. He's going to be in you. In verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. How are you going to come to us? In the person of the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, yet a little while and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. I'm going to die, I'm going to be resurrected, but you're going to live also. You're going to see this resurrection in your own day. In John 14, 20, at that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. How? In the person of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever stopped and said, Lord... Thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Thank you that He, if you're saved, you can say He's with me and He's in me. And I'm going to tell you what, the only reason I made it this far is because of that truth. I would not make it without Him. Matter of fact, Jesus says in the next chapter, John 15, without me you can do nothing. But Jesus isn't going to be here without me, without my presence in you, in the person of the Holy Spirit, you can do nothing. He's with you now. But just in a few days after the resurrection, three days down the road, he's going to be in you. And then on the day of Pentecost, the word Pente means 50, 50 days after the crucifixion. That's when Pentecost took place. He's going to be, he's going to empower you. And he, we, we read about that this morning. So he said in John 20, 22, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And they receive the Spirit of God. Now they're not empowered yet that happens on Pentecost but they receive the person of the Holy Ghost so Jesus explaining to them the simple but profound ministry of the Holy Ghost of God and well stop that's why the Bible says quench not the spirit he said don't grieve the spirit why he's your only hope he's your only help if we quench and grieve the Holy Spirit we, Jesus can't help us. The Father can't help us. He sent the Spirit to help us. He's our comforter. But we're not going to be what we ought to be. We're going to fail over and over and over again. If we quench and grieve the Holy Spirit, we, we quench Him by, uh, like you put out a fire. You quench the fire. You throw cold water on the Holy Ghost when He wants to do something. When He's speaking to your heart and He's telling you to go do something and you say, I don't know if I can do that or not. You just threw water on the fire. You grieve the Holy Spirit when we sin. Grieves the heart of God. He is God. He's the God as much as Jesus is God. He's God as much as the Father is God. There are one God, three in one. We understand the Trinity. We understand the concept of the Trinity. I don't know if anybody's ever been able to explain the Trinity, but we understand there's three persons and one God, and God in His wisdom has chosen to manifest Himself in three persons. One God... The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. All of them have a job. Father's in charge. The Son came to die for the sins of the world. The Spirit came to indwell the church or Christian people, those who are saved. And so Jesus said, He's with you. One of these days, He'll be in you. And we want to thank God. I mean, there, there's a, where would we be without the Holy Spirit? I know I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be preaching. I wouldn't be doing things. I know that only the Holy Ghost of God has preserved me as the songwriter wrote in Amazing Grace, through many, many snares, toils, and dangers, I have already come. Grace that brought me safe thus far, grace will lead me home. You could put in there, it's by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit, I've been brought safe thus far, and the Holy Spirit will lead me home. It is the grace of God manifest in the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, look at verse 21, and this really is the thought that I want to leave with you in verse 21, 22, and 23. And he says this, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. He goes on to say in verse 22, Jesus, Judas saith unto him, not his carrot, but the other Judas, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answers and said unto him, If a man love me, he's telling him how he's going to manifest himself. If a man love me, he will keep my words. If he loves, obedience, and then he said, 
and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. The word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's. These things I have spoken to you, being yet present with you. Reminding them again that he's going to go away. Now, I want you to notice something back in verse 24, really in verse 23. The last two phrases there, he says, And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. Now listen. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. A lot of folks don't know that, but he does love the world. But he's talking to these 11 right now. He's talking to those who are the inner circle. He's talking to those who will become the apostles and prophets and the foundation of the church. And he goes on to say, If you will love me enough to keep my commandments, listen to me now. He said, I will love him He'll be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Most Christians know nothing about that. They do not know what it means to enter into the presence of God, to feel the love of God. We can say out of head knowledge, uh, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. We can sing the songs about the love of God, we know, but until you, you sense it, you feel it, and God manifests His love to you because of your love for Him and your obedience to Him, you will not know this, this truth. He said, I will love Him in a special way. God loves those who love Him in a special way. He manifests Himself to them in a special way, in special seasons of prayer and worship and praise and leadership of the Holy Spirit. And most Christians do not know anything about that. He goes on to say in verse 20, 23, Jesus answered and said to him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. He keeps going back to that. And then he said, And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now, the Holy Spirit is going to come. He's going to indwell every believer. The Bible says we are sealed by the Spirit until the day of redemption. So what does he mean when he says the Father will love him? God loves everybody. And we will come unto him. That has to be in the person of the Holy Spirit. Father is on the throne. Jesus sits right behind the Father of the throne. So it's in the, in the power of the Spirit, in the person of the Spirit. And notice these words, and make our abode with him. It's one thing to live in another person's home. It's a different thing to feel at home. You understand what I'm saying? You might be forced to go, you know, and live with other people or to be moved to a nursing home or somewhere and you can say, that's my abode. But Jesus is saying here, we will come and we will abide with you. We will make our abode. We will come in and we will have this wonderful fellowship together. The abode. We'll feel at home around one another. We'll have such a, a, a loving and close and, and powerful relationship. Nothing that others will know about. Because you love me and you keep my commandments. We'll not only be with you and in you, but we're going to make our abode with you. And we're going to manifest ourselves to you. That's why men of God can get up and say, The Holy Ghost said, and the Holy Ghost gave me this message. Why? Because He manifested Himself to them. Gave them a message to preach. And then we'll make our abode. We're going to settle down. That means settle down and make yourself at home. Because you love Him and because you're living a life of obedience. He said, I'll come and we're going to, we're going to make a dwelling place. You've got a dwelling place up there, but while you're down here, we're going to come, we're going to move in, and we're going to have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful relationship, more than relationship, a fellowship that most people don't know about. This is the manifest presence of Christ takes place in the heart so let's go back and just review that thought for a moment how to enjoy the reality of Christ's presence how do I get in on this 
And then simply, it's right here in the scriptures. Number one, love him. Love him. Love is a choice. Did you know love is a choice? You choose to love him. It's like in Bible days, um, they did not have courting and gating and so forth. Two fathers met and said, my son's 14 years old. Your daughter's 14 years old. When they get of age, let's say 20 years old, we'll, we'll hook them up and let them get married. They didn't have any choice in the matter. It wasn't, it wasn't court and date and I fell in love. No, they went to the altar. They said, I do. Went to the tent and looked at each other and said, who are you? And then you wake up one morning and say, why did I, why did daddy hook me up with her? The same reason my daddy hooked me up with you. There wasn't no love. Love had to become a choice then. I choose. God chose to love us. He didn't love me because I was such a wonderful person. He loved me while we were yet sinners. He loved us. Committed his love toward us and died for us while we were yet sinners and wicked and ungodly. He loved. He chose to love. And so we choose to love him. Why? Because of all he's done for us. When Jesus was asked the question, the Pharisees trying to trip him up in his words, they said, Lord, what's the greatest commandment of all? He did not hesitate. He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and mind and strength. And Paul went on to give a great, I'm talking about a rebuking word in 2 Corinthians. He said, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, accursed, Maranatha at the Lord's coming. Paul said, man, if you don't love Jesus, you're going to be cursed at the Lord's coming. True love will lead you to obedience. That's why he said, you love me, and he that loveth me will keep my commandments. He that loveth me will keep my words. And so true love leads you to obedience, worship, praise, adoration. What David said in the psalm this morning is, Oh Lord, how Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. How excellent is thy name. David loved the Lord. The Bible says that when Saul was rejected as king, he said through Samuel, God hath found a man after his own heart. David was a man after God's heart. And that's why he was taken and made king. So love him. Number two, keep his commandments, his words. We need to know his word. We need to study his word. We need to meditate in his word. I said this morning, uh, David said, um, uh, When I consider the heavens the work of thy hands, thy fingers made all the, the firmament, the stars and the moon. When he said, I, I, I see the great wonder, the marvelousness of, and the majesty and the miraculous uh, of God in creation. He said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Meditate. He said, when I consider, when I stop, stop. Billy Henderson said, turn the junk off and listen for that still small voice. Turn the TV off, turn the radio off, turn the internet off, turn everything off. If you want to walk with God, have His blessing, His presence, you've got to get alone with God if you want this relationship. Understand His Word. It only comes through hours of meditation. Apply His Word to later life. Obedience to His Word. The proof of love is obedience. You can say, I love the Lord, I love the Lord, I love the Lord. But if you're not obeying this word right here, this book right here, if you're not obeying not only the words of Jesus, but every word between Genesis and Revelation, chapter 22, if you're not living out that word, seeking to be obedient to that word, His commandments, His desires, His truth, His principles, you do not love Him. And if you don't love Him, He's not going to come and manifest His love to you. And He's not going to come and manifest Himself to you. Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so when I pick up this Bible, in a sense, I just picked up Jesus. When I read His words, I'm reading the words of Jesus. I don't care if we come out of Genesis, or Revelation, or anywhere in between. He is the Word. When I love His Word enough to obey Him... I am loving 
Jesus. You know how we can say that we love Him and we have no care, no concern, no hunger for the Word who is Jesus. He's the Word. And then the third thing is this. He said the Father will love that person. The Father will love you. He will manifest His love to Him. He will make His presence felt not just in theory, not just in your head, but you feel and sense and acknowledge and by faith go out and living in the presence of the Spirit of God. We fellowship with Him in a very personal way. I mean, Jesus is not just throwing this out for everybody. Qualifications, you love me, you obey me. You obey me, then I know you love me. And if you love me, I will love you. The Father will love you. And we will come and make our house. We'll make your house our house. We'll come and live with you. We'll come and every day, all day long, we'll live with you. And we'll have a great time together. 1 John 1.1 1, 1, That which is from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled the word of life, John is writing, this is the same John that wrote the Gospel of John that we're reading tonight. And he said, that which is from the beginning, Jesus who is from the beginning, we heard Him, we have seen Him, we have looked upon Him, our hands have handled the Word of life, and that life was manifested, and we have seen it, and we bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and manifested unto us. Listen to what he said, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son Jesus Christ. Sort of sums it all up. John says, I knew Him, I saw Him, I handled Him, I, I touched Him and I had personal one-on-one -on -one relationship. John is called the Apostle of Love. John's the one who leaned on Jesus' breast at the supper, at the upper room discourse, this is the final supper. Jesus, John said not something about this loving relationship. And he says, you know what? Everything that I experienced, you can experience. The reason that I'm sharing this is because I want you to have the fellowship that I have with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And then the outcome of it is, of course, then we will come unto Him and make our abode with Him. So we love Him. We keep His commandments. Then the Father will love us. He will come to, unto us and abide with us. Make His presence real. Um, you know, we talked about Sammy Allen. We talked about him driving down the highway and done a lot of other crazy things like that. Driving down the highway, running out of gas. He just said, stop over the next station. God, Holy Ghost said, stop at the next station. He didn't know the guy. didn't know anything about the guy. Fill up the guy, car. Fill up the car. <laughs> Brother Travis. You got to know Brother Travis Clayton too. We called him uh, Hurricane Clayton. And uh, went in. The man said, he said, uh, you got gas? He said, yes, sir. He said, looked at him and said, you, you guys Baptist preachers? Yeah. Yeah. He said, no charge tonight. It's on me. How did Sammy Allen know that? He will manifest himself to you. Make His presence easily seen and felt. Make His voice heard. Make His abode, our home, our hiding place, abiding place, a special, personal way only those, to only those who love Him and obey Him. And so it comes to a total surrender to the Lordship of Christ. A total surrender to God's will. You see, there's not very many guys who would be driving down the highway and the whole ghost tell them, go stop this gas station. Most of them will say, well, I'm going to stop. I'm getting gas. That's the way we think. Not Sammy Allen. He felt that tug from another world. He heard that voice inside. And he always followed it. Brother Henderson knows him real well. Close, close friends for years. And he said he's more sensitive to the Holy Ghost than anybody I ever knew. He, he, he could hear the voice of God. How do you do that? He almost memorized the New Testament. A lot of time in the Word. And if you kept Sammy Allen in your home, he would come, he'd get up in the morning about 5 o'clock, he'd go in the bathroom, and he'd pray over the toilet. 
and it'd pray for about three hours. So you better hope you didn't have to go to the bathroom before Brother Sammy got in there. In other words, everybody got up early, went to the bathroom because they knew he was in the ba he's in the bathroom praying, just getting along. That's the only place he'd get along by himself. He'd go in there and pray for hours, hours. And you, you hope they had five rooms and a path. I'm saying you can have that, I can have that, we can have that. If we just need to slow down, slow down. You know, the devil, his 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 devices, one of them is just keep us so busy. We're so busy, so busy. But when you're too busy to do this, you're too busy for God. You're too busy. You're just too busy. You need to cut some junk out of your life that you can spend more time with the Lord. Let's bow for prayer, please. Every head bowed and every eye closed.